here with Alikeka Kasi debate, a college um, student, of course. And then aside from that, we'll be also look at uh, the Democrat and then the Republican, Jenison, about some of their policy. But so, without any further ado, let's get on to this video and check this out. How we doing, everybody? Yeah! Are we ready to make Trump the next president of the United States yeah! this November? All right, we're going to have some fun here. And uh, as you guys know, it's an open mic. And also joining us is Tulsi Gabbard today. Give it up. Aloha. Good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. Look at that sea of red hats. I love that, everybody. All right. This conversation today, we want to keep it focused on the election questions you guys have about that. So we really want to stay focused on that. Um, as you guys know, uh, this is a lot of fun. Free speech is respected here on the right. And uh, I'll tell you, this is pretty amazing to see in Tucson of all places, everybody. This is pretty great. So uh, we have a question here from somebody. Hi, let's get hi, Char hi Charlie. Uh, my name is Bryce. Um, <laughs> That's very loud. I wasn't expecting this many people to come here. But uh, I recently just came out as they, them. Um, and I was talking to my guys over there at the White Dudes for Harris. Um, and uh, we were talking about like who we were voting for and everything. So obviously I'm going to be voting for Kamala Harris because Taylor Swift is. Um, but this, is, this was a question that I kind of wanted to ask more in private, not in front of all these people. But... Because I identify as they, them, does that mean I can vote multiple times? Well, have you voted already? No, I have not. Well, maybe uh, since that, you... That's a legitimate question, it, it actually. Is, it is. <laughs> Tulsi, do you want to take this? Um, <laughs> well, I will, I will tell you that uh, since you haven't voted yet, maybe as they, them, could vote for Trump Vance 2024. Okay. Can I, can I vote twice? Probably not. Okay, then I'm not a they them anymore. <laughs> but I will say, though, that you can cancel out any of your support with Kamala Harris by voting for Donald Trump. I will be voting for Donald Trump in 2024. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bryce, for your question. Give it up for Bryce, everybody. <laughs> All right, now how the fuck do I get out of here? Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello. Um, first of all, First of all, wow. It's crazy to see two of the most, two of the most active uh, conservatives here. And uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Tulsi, for your service. I appreciate it a lot. For I appreciate you for defending our country. Thank you. And so... Um, What's my, your name? My name is Jew, like the religion, but I'm a Christian. <laughs> so... Uh, Do you have to say that a lot? Uh, yeah. It, it, I don't know. It's kind of like a signature calling card, but that's just me. Um, so for context for my question, I suffer from anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. I've been through a lot in my life. I've done good things and I've done bad things. And because of, because of my life experiences, I have, a, I have a very bad tendency to catastrophize a lot about a lot of things, but more specifically our future. And I look on social media and everywhere I go, and admittedly fake news, but I go everywhere, I look everywhere, and I see a lot of hatred and a lot of division going on from mostly the left admittedly, but it's... Um, Overall, it's just a lot of hatred and division going on. And so the question I really want to ask you both is, as men and women of America, as, as, religious, as religious people, and as, conser and as political figures, what inspires, you, uh, what inspires you to keep on going and to keep on, and to keep on being optimistic in a country that seems to be so full of hate and political division right now? First of all, it's God, okay if I record, right? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. I find my hope in God and God's unconditional love for every single one of us. Yeah. So no matter how dark the days may seem, and sometimes there are very dark days, and we face dark times in our future, if we don't take action now and in this election, but even in those darkest of times where I find strength, where I find peace, and where I find courage to be a voice for common sense and the truth and freedom for, the, for all Americans, uh, it, it comes from knowing that God's love is eternal and that he will give me that clarity and strength to do the right thing 
for the right reasons. Thank you. Yeah, and for me, I mean, look around you. This should give you hope for the future. I mean, this is supposed to be on a liberal college campus. <laughs> and I, I agree with Tulsi. Um, we, we must understand that there is a God and we are not him. And that God Amen. has a plan and that God loves us. And as a Christian, I believe that that manifested in his son, Jesus Christ, Amen. and those who give their life to Jesus Christ. Um, and so, look, we must not grow tired in doing good or noble things. And what an amazing thing. And I'll only correct one thing you say. Okay. Because um, this is not about conservative or liberal today. I consider myself a conservative. Tulsi at one time ran for president as a Democrat. Everybody, this is a moment that's bigger than politics. Yes. That this is now bigger than whether Charlie's a conservative or Tulsi was co-chair of the DNC. This is about America and defeating the forces that want to destroy our country. Amen. That is what this is all Let's about. Let's go! Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for, thank you for coming here today. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Who's up next? So, uh, first off, I'd like to personally thank Tulsi Gabbard for destroying Harris's 2020 presidential run. <laughs> and so this is mainly towards Charlie Kirk because I sort of know your views. Obviously, the topic of of uh, like foreign involvement, U.S. foreign involvement in foreign countries is a little contentious with conservatives right now. How would you balance supporting our allies and supporting, even if it unfortunately means we have to send troops in, with how how would you balance that with also uh, working on our internal supporting internal our our own people? I, I think this is actually a better question oh, for okay. Tulsi, yeah, if that's okay. okay. No. Uh, th this is one of her her yeah. passion topics, so, and Tulsi um, served and serves uh, in our military, and so Tulsi, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I mean, th this is personal for a lot of reasons. I still serve in the Army Reserve. I'm a lieutenant colonel and a battalion commander. I've deployed to three different war zones at different times over the last 20 years. I have friends who are deployed into combat zones today. I know Kamala Harris is not aware of their existence. <laughs> which is a, 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 both a sad and disastrous state of affairs that in and of itself disqualifies her to be our commander in chief. But I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who lost both of his legs in combat. And all of us who raise our hands and volunteer to serve in our military are willing to lay our lives down to ensure the safety, security, and freedom of the American people. What we do not sign up for is politicians who care more about feeding the military industrial complex and the war machine than they do about our lives, but the safety and security of the American people's lives. Yeah, what, we need, what we need are leaders, and this is why I've endorsed President Trump in this election, who will always make those decisions in balancing, you asked a very good question, how do you balance uh, the need for us to engage and stand with our allies and partners and, and put the American people's interests first. Every decision has to be made within the, the context of what serves the needs of the American people first, yep. period. And that, that includes our national security needs. That includes our liberty and our freedom, which is often on the line when we are in a state of war. The war machine takes advantage of that to try to take away more of our freedom. And it has to do with our economic well-being as well. If we have a president and commander in chief who makes every decision about what's in the best interest of the American people, we won't go wrong. And, and I'll just say one thing. We don't have to overcomplicate this. We should not send another dollar to Ukraine while our border is wide open. Period. Can I, can I, uh, uh, yes, please follow up with Tulsi, but so, I just, that, that's right, my yeah. position in one sentence. So the reason I ask that is, is a little personal because I'm from Japan, and obviously the, China has been increasingly aggressive. And there's a, why a lot of Japanese people are reluctant to fully support Trump is they're afraid that you'll sort of throw us under the bus if China drags Japan into a war. So uh, Here, here's what I'd say to that. And I understand the concern, but we need a president who will prevent war. Right. Period. Yeah. Yeah. But Period. Um, I, I agree. And the opportunity is there with the right kind of leadership. And this is a huge point of difference between President Trump and Kamala Harris Kamala Harris has criticized President Trump for doing what we should expect our leaders to do, which is to engage in direct diplomacy, whether it be with dictators or adversaries, opposition, as well as friends and partners, because that's how you pre that, that is how you prevent war. Yes, it is strength. It is peace through strength. 
But that's not just through the buildup of military hardware and capability. That's through engaging in the kind of leadership that we've seen in President John F. Kennedy, that we've seen in President Ronald Reagan, and that we saw in President Trump's first administration. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. All right. People who have election-related questions, uh, disagreements for Tulsi and I, come on to the front of the line, guys, or just uh, we can keep going. So it's open mic. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, my name is Aileen. Um, I, I am a U.S. citizen, but I was raised in Mexico. Um, I came here because my parents one day want to come back, but legally, you know? They want to do it the, in the right way. And by coming here to school, it, it was going to be a, an opportunity. But the school looks like it's going to give more opportunity to people who don't come here legally instead of me, who I am a citizen and I am... I've been working for a year, over a year, to get my scholarship. Nothing came back, so today I had to drop out of college, sadly. I'm sorry. Um, and how is it possible that I have to go back to my parents in Mexico and try to look for a job there when I've been looking for months here in the United States as a citizen to fight for my rights to get a job? and get an income here just so my parents can come back in the right way. And also, my family is fully Democrat. I am here opening up, finally. If they see me over there, <laughs> if they see me over there, I'm sorry for you, but I've opened my eyes. I've opened my eyes. Thank you. <laughs> I love your thoughts on this, Tulsi, but I'll say this. It is reprehensible and wrong that the people that come here the right way are punished and the people that come here the right the wrong way are rewarded that is wrong yes. the people that cut in line get benefits mm -hmm. they get taxpayer funded subsidies they get flights to the city they're choosing they get luxury hotels where you came here the right way you followed the rules yes. and you are being punished it is a breakdown of justice and fairness yeah. and Donald Trump will not put up with that. He will say if you follow the rules, you'll be rewarded. If you break the rules, you will be punished. That is yeah. what Trump will do as president. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just want to encourage you and Sorry. tell you to stay strong. Don't give up. Keep up the fight. You are doing the right thing in the right way and know that you're not alone. Thank you. Hey, you just just love, okay? one thing, one thing. Jesus Christ loves you all. He will come back one day. Amen a todos. Cuídense. God bless you. What, what a great soul. Okay, uh, I thought we had a disagreement. Maybe if not, oh, we can just keep going. No? Okay, great. Uh, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And uh, my name is Christopher. Uh, I had a lot of questions, a lot of debates in the crowd uh, today. Uh, but my main question would be, sorry, would be um, how do we start having conversations in the workplace without infringing on you know the rules of work but still be able to make it friendly because I used to work at a job where I would bring up you know uh, conversations about border and, and um, immigration and uh, abortion and stuff and I would make people aware I would, I would give them factual news information but then they all turned on me all of a sudden one day and I didn't understand how you could go from smiling in your face to stabbing you in the back the next day. And how do we cultivate a more friendly atmosphere in our, in our workforce where we're mostly at majority of our life? I mean, the First Amendment is the First Amendment. Yeah. I think when you're having these conversations, what I have found, even when I meet with people who come into the conversation ready for a fight, mm -hmm. when you listen first, and if they are communicating in good faith, yeah. then you can have a true and real conversation that is based on respect. Yeah. You can respect where someone's coming from even if you disagree with them. Right. And then share your own experience, share your own thoughts, share what's on your heart with them. And again, if it's a good faith conversation, then it will, it will flourish from there. If they're not interested in having a conversation, it's not worth confronting yeah, them Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. No Appreciate problem. it. God Thank you. you God bless you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm currently undecided. Yeah, just try to talk right in the mic, okay? Gotcha. So I'm currently undecided in the uh, election. And so my main issue that would be the turning point for me in voting for Trump over Kamala Harris would be um, essentially just corruption and corporate money in government, which is my biggest issue by far. And from all of the research I've done, it seems to consistently point to the same amount of money being sent to both political parties. So I'd like to hear your argument as a Republican for voting for Trump in that regard. 
I mean, I can tell you, uh, I, I don't have the actual numbers on the top of mind, but I'll take Big Pharma as one example. Their capture of the FDA and so many of these agencies that are supposed to be looking out for us are actually looking out for Big Pharma. And when you look at the amount of money that's been given to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, it far outweighs by many multiples of 10 how much has been given to the Republican Party, first of all. Second of all, Trump has spoken to this specific issue directly in his podcast with Theo Vaughn, specifically about Big Pharma and his willingness uh, to take them on. President Trump isn't looking for handouts from big corporations at all. Uh, he's shown that he is ready to take on, uh, not only through his own actions, by bringing people together like Bobby Kennedy, who's who's dedicated his entire life to taking on these big industries, that ha that he is serious about taking our government back and, and putting it back into the hands of the people. Right, yeah. so um, I understand that, but to me, there's just two sides to this. From what I've seen, it tends to be that, yes, like you said, Big Pharma does give a significantly larger money amount of money to the Democratic Party. But from what I've seen, companies like oil companies, for example, will give a significantly larger amount to the Republican Party. So in my mind, it honestly just seems like a choice between which corporations I'd rather win, and I'm just not a big fan of that. Okay, so let me, a couple things though. Trump has said that no lobbyists will be part of his transition team, which is very important. So the person, out, you know who is? Tulsi Gabbard is part of his transition team. And I just want to brag on Tulsi for a second. Tulsi ran for the president as ran for president as a Democrat, and was the co-chair of the Democrat National Party. Um, she wrote an amazing book that you got, you should check out and read, where she saw not just the corruption from corporations, but how corporations have merged with government and then are repressing our free speech rights. So you look at what the Democrat Party has become. They are shameless in wanting the FBI and the Department of Justice to try to interfere on their behalf to try to get a specific result where Donald Trump is the victim of that sort of administrative state lawfare persecution. Secondly, and I think this is a really important thing, is, and I'd ask you, um, what, what issue would you say is the most important to make sure that corporate influence is diminished? Maybe foreign policy, like war, would probably be a big one, right? I could say confidently, and it's not even close, Kamala Harris is out raising money 10 to 1 from the war machine versus Donald Trump. She had Leon Panetta speak at her convention. Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney have endorsed her. The warmongers that gave us the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war are her senior advisors now of her inner circle. And so I will say that you're never gonna find a perfect candidate with the issue you care about, because unfortunately you have to raise a lot of money to be able to compete. However, on the issue that I think is one of the most important, are people getting rich off the suffering and the death of others through declaring and invading wars? It's not even close. Kamala Harris is financing her campaign from Halliburton, from Boeing, from Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. Right, so I definitely understand that. That's a great argument. Um, I get that they do have to raise money, and I would say that, yeah, my biggest issue would be in terms of war and big pharma specifically, like she was talking about. So, yeah, that would end up leaning me towards the Republican Party, despite myself being a liberal. So, um, yeah, I think those are some great points. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great think questions. About that. Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for him. That was a great in faith question, wasn't it? It was great. Okay, uh, disagreements or just questions in general? Yeah, come on up. Uh, anybody? Sure? Yeah. Oh. Good afternoon. Thank you for your service, Ms. Gabbard, for anything. Um, I just have one question related to the, uh, to the election for you. How can you endorse someone who lost the last election, fair and square, there's no evidence. Let them finish, guys. Republican secretaries of state claimed it was fair. Trump tried to leverage the Georgia secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger, he said, find me 11,700 votes. He has no respect for losing in our system, and it... I mean, what happened on January 6th happened on January 6th. A disaster. Our capital, our capital got stormed for the first time since 1812. You people claim to love America. Like, how does that not fire you up? You're brainwashed. All right, so let's... It, it's, it's a fair question. So let's talk through a couple elements of this. First, um, do you think the CIA should involve itself in American elections? No. Okay, so it did in 2020. Sh show me proof. Okay, well, 
Tulsi Gabbard knows this, she could tell you, 50 Intel officials colluded, led by Tony Blinken due to declassified emails, signing an open letter calling the Hunter Biden laptop so Russian. So why, why weren't any of the lawsuits successful? Let, let me finish. I, I did not inter- Hold He'd on. you raised plenty of them. Hold on a second. I didn't interrupt you, right? Uh, so let me finish. 50 Intel officials, current and former, signed a letter that was used to censor on social media the fact that there is a laptop owned by Hunter Biden that showed very suspicious and criminal activity by both Hunter and Joe Biden. According to the Media Research Center, one out of four voters in swing states would have changed their vote if they would have known about the Hunter Biden That's laptop. That's an utter ridiculous statement Well, to make. I, just, I just cited it. He lost but, by 7 million votes. Well, hold on. No, no. He lost by 40, 42,000 votes across three states. Hold on, pal. How much did he lose Arizona by? Uh, okay. No, no. T- hold on. How much did he lose this state by? It's, it's not about the final score. It's Ten? a winner and a loser no, and a loss. No, That's we, how our system works. We have an electoral college system? Yeah. So, so Who how got much? the electoral votes? No, of course Biden did, but yeah. what was the margin in Arizona? I don't know. It was 10,000 votes. Not in the back of my head. Yeah, so it, how, how much in Georgia? <laughs> it was 11,700. Yeah. That's what they told okay. Graffersburger and, to find And them. in Wisconsin, it was... A Republican tw- let who me denounces finish. them. And in Wisconsin, it was 21,000, right? So it was actually 42,000, not 7 million. So when you're talking about the CIA and the Department of Justice signing a letter that was then used to... I, I did not have my Twitter account for 30 days. We were not allowed to mention the Hunter Biden laptop. Because you violated the private company's privacy. Well, like, no, actually, I didn't. Guidelines. It's actually yes, be- did. No, because what? of the Twitter files, thanks to Elon Musk, we now know the FBI told Twitter to say you are not allowed to mention the Hunter Biden laptop. Am I correct in this, Tulsi? That's correct. And so, so you don't trust the FBI at all? Well, People who not have devoted no. their life Th- to civil service. Th- that's a red herring. I'm saying in that what instance, to, Yoel Roth, do you know who Yoel Roth was? I don't know yeah, who Yoel okay. Roth Yoel is. Yoel Roth was the head of security, trust, and safety for Twitter that had a standing, what's called a standing room meeting every Tuesday with the Federal Bureau of Investigation in San Francisco where they met about Russian threats to American interference of, of elections, and they said this laptop is not allowed to be discussed on your platform. That impacted our election. People made their decisions differently in 2020, not knowing the full picture that this laptop existed, and that was the October surprise. So you would agree <laughs> that what? that's not a fair election. You think election. the laptop would have flipped the election for him? Well, we're talking about 42,000 votes in three states, and I already cited a study that one in four swing voters would a have changed study their, by who? The media Clarence research. Clarence Thomas is Winnebago buyer? Like, who funds these? I, I, just, I just said... <laughs> By, by the independent, nonpartisan media research center, where they said one out of four voters would have changed their opinion. So I just want to make sure we're clear, though. You agree our government should not interfere with our elections. Well, they, they have to regulate them by nature. That's what? the states what? have to. Well, no, hold on. Otherwise, you wouldn't the, have an election because f- you need I, rules. I said, and I said a judge. interfere, interfere. <laughs> so should the federal government be able to restrict our speech during elections? Well, when you have what happened in 2016 where Russian disinformation spreads all over what? Facebook and other platforms, then that you have... That was a lie! So it wait, was not a lie. Who is it was lying? not a lie. It, it, Read the Mueller report. Another Republican. Wait, you realize respected. The, the Mueller report found that there was no tangible collusion between it's, Donald Trump or the it Russian wasn't about Federation. Collu- it wasn't about, but, but it on. wasn't I, just a collusion I, thing. I, it's a 430-page report. I want to try to find common ground here, okay? I want to try to find common ground. Can we agree that 2020 was decided by very few votes? No, because it wasn't. Well, 42,000 votes is very few, right? No. Uh, so f- what is the percentage of 42,000? It's, it's not about George Bush and Al Gore were as close as ever in 2000. Al Gore conceded, said, you know what, oh, I okay, lost. But that, there might be a challenge. Hold on. Because but, uh, he uh, cared about the good he, of the he, country. You know, Al Gore brought it all the way up to the Supreme Court, man. And he said that Bush was not the duly elected president. And he could have gone further because... How do you go further the, than the, the Supreme the, Court? The, 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 <laughs> The Supreme, the Supreme Court sent it back to judgment in the Florida State Supreme Court again, and Gore said, no, I'm not doing that. Just move on. Bush is the president. For yeah. the good of the country. Because yeah, people so, but, used to care about, the, about our country. No, and I, of course, so are you trying to imply Trump doesn't care about the country? Yes, that's absolutely what, what I'm implying. You think, you, think, you think he sits in his gold room in Trump Tower and thinks, oh, how can I make things better for, for everyday Wait, so, Joe? So let, let me ask one thing, and I'd love to have Tr- Tulsi. Just help me understand. So his business empire has been taken away from him. He's facing yeah, because sep- he broke the law. Let me. Can I finish my thought? Okay. He's finishing seven hundred. He's facing seven hundred years in federal prison. He's been shot once with multiple assassination attempts. Why keep running for president if he doesn't love the country? Because a hundred years from now, in a history textbook, it's going to say Donald Trump's name, and that's what motivates narcissists. What? Okay. Look, I. I will say this. I, I hope you do some research.
because I've done my research. You need to do your research. You clearly yeah. have it, man. Look, I, I will say this as kindly as I can. Um, one day I hope you open your eyes because you've been significantly brainwashed on this topic. And, and I guess the final question I'll ask is this. If Donald Trump wins in three weeks, will you accept that as a legitimate result? Yes. Okay, I'll hold That's you to that. That's the difference between me and you. Okay, was, did Trump win in 2016? Yes. But you said that Russian yeah. interfered. Russian interference had a role in the election, but Trump won fair and square. He had more votes and more. Oh, and notice how Hillary. Notice how Hillary supporters didn't storm well, the Capitol. Well, no, Capitol. hold on. H Hillary never, she yes, never conceded. Yes, she did. No, hold on. She had a concession speech H the day after the election. I watched H H it in H middle Hillary school. Hillary Clinton said Donald Trump was not the legitimate president of the United States. That's one milked clip that oh, is played okay. all okay. over the internet. Thank, yeah, she had thank, a concession speech. When's the Trump concession wait, speech in 2020? Ask, let me Show ask you, it to me. Let me ask one more question. Are you voting for Kamala Harris? Yes, I am. What's, proudly. What, what's her greatest accomplishment? Her greatest accomplishment? Um, I would I would say that she's going to she's going to legalize marijuana federally, something that's been overdue by 100 years. Thank you. She said it. I have a question. I uh, took one hour to listen to Kamala Harris. And my question is this. The President of the United States has to make command decisions. That's 80% of his job, to, or her job, to make command decisions. Could you explained, have you ever seen any evidence that Kamala Harris, excuse me, Vice President Harris, I'm not sure what the, what the name is, can make command decisions? Has anybody has any evidence that she can make command decisions? That's 80% of what the President of the United States does. Look at the border. No. Never. No is the answer to that. Uh, we, we saw, again, I mentioned uh, earlier, it hit close to home when she looked into the cameras during that debate and spoke to tens of millions of Americans and made a statement about the fact that, according to her, we have no active duty troops in any combat zone anywhere in the world for the first time in a century. This is coming from a person who claims to sit in the Situation Room and be the last person in the room with Joe Biden in every major decision. This is coming from a person who President Biden says that he delegates all domestic and foreign policy issues to her because of his confidence in her. And yet, our lives are not valuable enough to her for her to know how many men and women or that there are men and women in harm's way today who are serving our country. I have seen zero proof over these last three and a, year, three and a half years that she is qualified and capable of leading our country as president and commander in chief. And if she's elected, we will face World War III and potentially nuclear war. Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question about what's going on in the Middle East. Um, you stated er earlier that you want to stop sending money to Ukraine until we can fix what's going on in our country. Uh, why, what will Trump do to stop what's going on in Palestine? Obviously what happened on October 7th, what Hamas did is an absolute tragedy and should not happen ever again. But how can we stand here and support what Israel is doing in Palestine? What, it doesn't justify each other. We can't say that, oh, it's because of what Hamas did, because what, ha what Hamas did was inherently evil. But isn't Israel doing the same thing? Uh, there is, you know, there's so many hostages that have been taken by Hamas, but 16,000 kids are dead in Palestine. So it's like, how can we... How can we even say they're going after Hamas if there's a whole generation of people getting wiped out? Yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I literally debated this for hours the other day. But yeah, a couple things. Um, we're not going to agree on what Palestine is or where it is. I don't want to get into that, but we're not going to agree on that. Um, Donald Trump would never have allowed it to happen. And Donald Trump has been very clear that he will bring peace back to the region because when he was president, there was peace as we had the Abraham Accords between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. No one wants to see kids die. Okay, I don't want that. You don't want that. Uh, we want to see a quick and decisive rec uh, reconciliation happen in the Middle East. Do you have thoughts there, Tulsi? Because it's a very complicated topic. It is. And I, the, the only thing I'll add to that is 
we have to take a step back and understand the threat of Islamist terrorism. And that is something that leaders across the Arab region and those of us in this country can agree needs to be defeated. President Trump showed how that's possible by being able to bring together all of these different stakeholders, and that's what he'll do again. But like, what, in what way will he be able to tell Israel to stop or tell Hamas to stop? Well, look, again, um, again yeah, exactly, peace through strength. What he exhibited as president is that, look, America gets what America wants in the world still. And if we want peace in the Middle East, we're going to get it. And we're the global reserve currency status. Saudi Arabia will do what we want. Here's what's happened, though, since um, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have run the country. We see, we see the rise of BRICS nations. We see America's strength actually erode and fade away. We need to use the leverage that we have towards peace. Currently, we use the leverage we have towards war. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, yes, next. Hi, my name's Ava, and I have grew up most of my life in North Carolina. And my grandma, she's from Asheville, and recently from Hurricane Helene, Asheville has been totally wiped out. No one's getting money, and FEMA is saying that everyone's supposed to get $750 to help, but everyone I know hasn't been getting approved. But all this money is going to Ukraine, Israel. I just want to understand, like, where is this money going to? And how come, like, we still have so much homeless population here? Our roads are horrible here. But we can't get $750 from a hurricane disaster, and now people are out of homes. So I would just like to know where that money is actually going. I was there in uh, Western North Carolina about a week and a half ago, shortly after Helene uh, went through there. And my heart is with your grandmother and your, any of your family that still remain in the area. I have friends who are both still actively serving and taking leave to go help out there, as well as many veterans who are going to small towns that no government entity has touched yet. Last night, they had a, a, a blizzard warning there in the mountains. They've got people who are homeless, who have no clothes, no food, no access to clean water, and dead bodies that are still being recovered. Unfortunately, the headlines have moved on. Your question is the most important question. When this was posed, this very same question was posed to the White House press secretary. You know what her response was? Mm -hmm. This is disinformation. The question is disinformation. Yeah. The problem with this is, they are prioritizing other interests ahead of the interests of our fellow Americans, your family and so many other friends and family who desperately need help right now. And if we dare criticize their failed response that is resulting in people getting sick and potentially dying in the aftermath of Helene, they criticize us for disinformation. This is what happens in dictatorships. Those in power identify themselves as the country, and if we dare criticize them, they then call us traitors who are dangerous. This is why free speech is so important. This is what the First Amendment is all about, and this is why we, it's up to us to hold them accountable. Otherwise, they're, they're going to continue to put the American people last. I'll, I'll just close with this. Um, you have family in Western North Carolina? Um, my grandma grew up in Asheville, and so, I've been there most of my so life. So there's an so. easy way she can get cash. You ready? She should fly to Mexicali, <laughs> walk across the border, declare asylum. She can get a free cell phone, free luxury hotel. $10,000. 10000 bucks, and all the U.S. taxpayer dollars. And then she can rebuild her house with American taxpayer dollars while she waits for her asylum date. What I'm getting at is that if you break into America, you're treated better than the citizens of this country who lost their homes in North Carolina. It's sick, it's wrong, and it ends in November, everybody. Yes. In such a polarized political environment, it feels like a real conversation has taken a backseat to virtue signaling and winning the argument. How do you think we can bring the focus back to meaningful debates where both sides listen and engage respectfully, even when they disagree? Tulsi, I'd love to have you answer this because you dealt with the lack of the culture of freedom of speech on the left. Yeah. Come in and listen first. Uh, I, I have so many different examples I could give you, but there's one in particular. When I was running for president, I was in a small town in Iowa and went to go meet with the newspaper editor there. 
I did it in every town that I went through, and I walked in knowing that he wanted to fight. And the issue that he wanted to fight about was climate change. He wanted to prove that he was right and I was wrong, even though he didn't really know what my position was. I listened to him, I listened to his points, and then I asked him, do you care about clean water? Do you care about clean air? He came from a long line of farmers. I said, do you care about having good soil quality so that your kids can continue to farm as your, your father and grandfather did? I care about those same things. I never use the word climate change at all, and we found common ground about these things that we uniquely cared about, me growing up in Hawaii and him growing up in Iowa. When we are willing to listen and engage in good faith, we can find those moments of common ground that will allow us to have those meaningful conversations around the things that are most important to all of us. God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should listen more and hear what people have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I want to invite any disagreements, you guys, more than welcome here. Uh, thank you. Yes, next question. Yeah, hi. I'd first just like to give a huge uh, welcome and thank you. Just thank you guys for being here uh, on behalf of the University of Arizona. Thank you. And all the students here, as I represent a, the student body, right? So uh, I just, I'd, I, I watched the Ovon last night, and it was uh, a podcast with, uh, with Bernie on that. And he, uh, for the first like, portion, went over health care reformation. In our, in our country uh, with some comparative analysis to other countries that are in the same bracket of uh, wealth and GDP. So uh, I just was wondering, maybe because I have a poor understanding of um, Trump's maybe uh, proposed structure to optimize what I think is a necessary healthcare reformation. Uh, I'll start, yeah, I'll start with this. And this is where I see huge opportunity. What I'm really excited, one of the things I'm excited about with President Trump winning is because of the people that he's chosen to surround himself with. Mm -hmm. Number one, mm -hmm. as, as Charlie said, there are no lobbyists for big pharma and big insurance sitting on the transition team right. to pick who is going to fill his cabinet. That's a huge difference huge. from any previous administration from mm -hmm. either party. Yeah, they're the biggest lobbyists. You've got right? Bobby right. Kennedy, who is sitting in position and already starting to choose people who recognize how broken our sick care system is and bring about the deeply, uh, the, the systemic change that we need to see yes. that will actually put our health and well-being first. That's not just about pushing pills on people to make big pharma richer, but actually dealing with the root causes of why our country is so sick and mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. how we can improve life for the American people. Okay. Tulsi's exactly right. The re one of the reasons, not the only reason, we spend more per capita on health care is that we're actively poisoning our kids yep. in what yep. we put in their cereal, in their food, yep. and the corporations are poisoning us. <laughs> Donald Trump putting Bobby Kennedy into the administration and on the transition team will be one of the greatest steps forward in protecting American health. For example, in Japan, 3% of kids at age 15 are chronically obese or overweight, 3%. Yep. 50% of our kids are chronically obese or overweight by the time they're 15. And it's not because just they're moving less, it's because what's in our food. We Red dye 22, blue dye 5 from what is in our food should be illegal and is illegal in most other countries. So if we are serious about health care, the number one thing we should focus on is the thing you put in your body more than anything else. Food. Food can either be medicine or poison. And it's currently poison in our country, which then creates type 2 diabetes, heart issues, coronary issues, obesity, overweight. So how do we get that? It's a long project. Yeah. You, you need to fix the literature on how we actually publish studies, blow up the food pyramid, and make the lobbyists for Kellogg's and Nestle not have a back door into the White House. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello. Thank you for having me. My name is Luke Wilson. Uh, I had a question since you guys seem to push Donald Trump's candidacy a lot, uh, especially because of his uh, America First policies, which I think we can all agree with. We're all tired in this country of uh, feeling like we're getting pushed down. Uh, my question was, however, is how do you guys reconcile with the fact that uh, despite so many American First policies and, and sort of speeches he gives, he still very adamantly supports Israel a country which at times seems to be opposed with our democratic values. So uh, this is the third Israel question. I think we've it's exhausted that. It's an important that. question, though. Yeah, again, but what did I say in the other two questions? Well, what about it? I, how no, do you meaning I'm not going to keep on answering the no, same what, question. What I'm asking, how do you reconcile with the fact that Donald Trump is so America first, but at the same time well, he has a contradictory... Well, hold on. Let me ask you a question. Is, he, is America first, America only? Yes. Oh, see, I disagree. I don't believe in America only. You do. 
Yes. Okay, so I disagree. I don't believe in America only. I think we should prioritize ourselves. But I think there is a place for America to be involved in international relations. I think there is a place for us to end wars unnecessarily and be involved in diplomacy. So you, have, you believe in America only. Donald Trump believes in America first. So don't conflate the two. America first does not mean we will not be involved in other countries, other affairs. It means we come first always, and then we can start involving ourselves in other countries and other areas and spheres of influence. Exactly, but we can't. We don't have. We, we are not putting America first and then trying to help no, Israel. No, no. Okay, but we agree. Putting so I, Israel first. I, I, what Trump has said is he said you stop foreign aid until our own border is secure and our people at least have some stability and some way of life. We've said that in the last couple questions. Okay. Now I will just ask a question about Israel, though, which I think is a moral clarifying issue. Do you think the Jewish people have a right to their ancestral homeland? I don't think it's their ancestral homeland. See, so the, now, okay. So this is the reason why we have a disagreement. Where is their ancestral homeland then? Uh, it's not defined. So it's not... For, for a long time, their history I mean, has been wandering people. Okay, so again... That, the that, land was given to them by Great Britain after World War II. Okay, so that, I, I'm and, not going to go into, like... Do you, do you know Joshua and Caleb and what happened, like, 5,000 years ago? Yes. Okay, so that's Canaan, the land of milk and honey, Judea and Samaria. So in order for you to be right, that means that the Bible is wrong. So are you a Christian? I'm Catholic, yes. Okay, so then do you believe the Bible? Yes. Well, then, is the Bible right or the Bible wrong? The Bible is right. Okay, so but then the what? A, hold on an aisle. What was King Hezekiah? Where was he? The, how about King David? King Solomon? I was just. King, the, how about Zechariah? Nehemiah? Where, where did they uh, operate? The borders defined today were defined by Great Britain. And well, after not World necessarily, War II. actually, because it says in the scriptures, all the way to the north of Nazareth, to the north touch of the Jordan River, to the southern tip of what is now Mount Carmel. So that's actually the border is very similar to modern Israel. We're not going to agree on this, but I believe the Jewish people have a right to their ancestral homeland. You, you, you don't even know where that is. That's and true. So, well, if you, whether or not we agree on that is not the issue. No, it actually is the well, issue. The, my, what I'm saying is, is I could really care less. It doesn't really affect – peace in the Middle East does not affect America in the way that a lot of people does. Well, but if we, if we must have it, if we must have it, Israel is not doing a good job in helping us with that as they're dragging us into a war with Iran instead of negotiating. Well, you're looking at two people that definitely don't want a war with Iran. I just asked right. a simple moral clarifying question, and we disagree, and that's okay. Donald Trump believes in America first, not America only, and that is a very important moral distinction. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. How are we doing? My name is, my name is Matt. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, so going into the next election, uh, we're picking the lesser of two evils. It's always been that way because Jesus Christ has never been on the ballot. And uh, my question to you is, what are some uh, policies you can educate myself and everyone here with that Trump's going to put into place? And what is your favorite policy? Uh, I can start and then Tulsi can go. Um, he will end the Russian-Ukrainian war. Blessed are the peacemakers. He will secure the southern border and restore sovereignty. No tax on tips, no tax on overtime, no tax on social security. No men and women's sports, establish energy independence, booming economy, middle class tax cut, and one of my favorites, what I think is so incredibly important, he will end the weaponization of government against political opponents, and we will not live in a country where you go to jail just because you have different ideas. Those are just some off the top of my head, and Tulsi can continue. Thank you. Uh, I think you covered the greatest hits, Charlie. I just want to take the opportunity to give a shout out. I was in Reno last night. Uh, at a University of Nevada Reno women's volleyball game. These women are taking a stand against biological males in their sport. They are forfeiting a game. They are a D1 team forfeiting a game because they refuse to play against San Jose State that has a biological male on their team. The courage these women are demonstrating are an inspiration and we look forward to many more of these teams taking a stand even at their own peril, even against their own university leadership and standing up and doing what's right. Thank you. And, Thank you so much. And uh, I'll just say one final thing. It's very important that people of faith view the election the way you did. It is a, a lesser of two evils always, but there is one that is better, and that one that is better fit towards our worldview, and that is Donald Trump. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Latinos for Trump! Hi. I have a question for Charlie. You said you support middle class tax cuts, but Trump promised billionaires in the top 1% a tax cut inevitably at the expense of everyone else. How does this not contradict your views? Okay, thank you. What's your name? Angelica. Uh, thank you for the question. So that is not true. That's just a commercial that Kamala Harris keeps running. And, I'm, I, I, and that's okay. Uh, Donald Trump has not promised billionaires a tax cut. In fact, 
what he has done is he actually executed the largest middle class tax cut in American history, which was the Economic Recovery Act of 2017. But more important than that, what is the hidden tax that all of you guys are paying every single day? Inflation. Inflation is the tax that no one voted for, but all of you guys are experiencing. Inflation was at record lows under Donald Trump. How many of you guys are suffering under inflation right now? And you are too. And so inflation actually makes you poor. But let me tell you, people that have money, they don't feel inflation. You know why? If you own assets, inflation is actually very good for you. If you own apartment buildings, condominiums, private jets, yachts, stocks, and bonds, inflation actually is a way to boost the value of your asset. You know who gets crushed by inflation? For those of you that are renting. For those of you who parents that don't own a mortgage. You guys get crushed by inflation. So I love the question, and I know that it's coming in good faith. I will just say that it's not true. When Donald Trump reduces inflation on day one, it will actually be the greatest tax cut in history because you guys will have increased purchasing power. Thank you. Okay, so first I want to thank you guys for coming out here. I appreciate what you do. Thank you for your service, Tulsi. Um, so I just want to ask, right, what, I'm already voting for Donald Trump. I'm just putting that out there, but... <laughs> What is he going to do about the homeless population, and especially with the veterans of this country? I think it's terrible how the Biden administration just ignores it completely. You know, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, homeless, the homeless crisis is facing, I think, every big city and, and many small towns across the country. Um, uh, there's a few quick things I'll hit on. You mentioned veterans specifically. Uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs needs a complete overhaul. It has become a uh, money-gobbling bureaucracy that does not serve all of the best needs of veterans, including homeless veterans. One of the things that Donald Trump will do is secure the border and make it so that resources go towards getting housing for homeless veterans rather than providing housing and money and food directly for illegal immigrants. Uh, he has within his first 100-day agenda to begin to start to build more affordable housing across our country and deploying those resources more towards local communities to be able to decide how best to deploy those resources. Uh, there's a lot of other things. When you bring down inflation, you bring down the cost of energy, you improve the economy. The rest of these challenges uh, will provide the opportunity to be solved. Yeah, and I'll just say one thing from a moral standpoint. We must have compassion for every American. With that being said, the streets are not your home, and we must find a way that we can treat all people without the streets of our cities becoming littered, more dangerous, and quite honestly, uh, areas that depress us, not that lift us up. Thank you very much. 100%. Can I get a hat? Thank you.